We can't talk about quantitative studies and critiquing those without talking about hypothesis testing because the cornerstone of quantitative research is actually collecting numerical data and then subjecting it to statistical tests to actually provide answers for our hypotheses. Before we get into that though, we do need to understand that all of the measurement tools that we use give us different types of data. So some some of the data we collect is either going to be nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So nominal is about groups and categories. There's no number attached to that. So an example might be uh, gender or perhaps religion or political affiliation. You know, if you have, um, say, religion as your one of your demographic variables, then perhaps you could say, I'm going to code everyone who is Catholic 1, everyone who's Apostolic 2, everyone who's Methodist 3, Baptist 4, Presbyterian 5, what in some kind of way like that. The numbers don't matter. It's whatever we choose to code it, it has to stay the same throughout. Otherwise, we're getting really crazy data. So nominal is categories that I call a number just for the sake of making it numerical data. Ordinal data is rankings like a Likert scale. There's no real number attached to it, but we can turn it into a number. So let's say that if you said strongly agree, I'm going to call it five. If it's agree, it's four, a neutral three, disagree two, strongly disagree one. That's kind of ranked, you know, agree is more than disagree, but it doesn't necessarily already have numbers attached to it. I gave them those numbers just so that we could do some statistical analysis on it. Um, so nominal and ordinal are like categorical variables. However, interval and ratio are continuous variables. That means that those specific variables have numbers associated with them. Interval, a good example of interval is temperature. The key hallmark of an interval measure is that there is no absolute zero. That means an absence of this thing. So an example is temperature, as I mentioned. You can have a temperature of zero, but that doesn't mean that there's no temperature. It just means that the temperature is zero, and then it can go to negative one, negative two, etc. So that's the big difference between interval and ratio. Ratio has a meaningful zero, so the scale starts at zero and works its way up, whereas interval does not have that zero point. So height is a ratio because your ruler starts at zero and then goes up in centimeters or inches. Okay, pulse, you start the counting and it starts at zero and then it goes up from there. Those are ratios. Okay, another thing that we need to know about hypotheses before we can test them is that there is a difference between research hypothesis and null hypothesis. The research hypothesis states the expected relationships among two or more variables. And then the null hypothesis is the opposite of the research hypothesis. So I encourage you to pause the video right now and read the examples on the screen of the research and the null hypothesis. You will see that they are opposite. Research hypothesis is actually what I think is the truth. That's what I think my variables are going to act like. Null is the opposite. And we actually use null hypotheses to test our statistical um, outcomes. So for hypothesis testing, this can get a little tricky. Basically, we're using um, the rules of negative inference. We don't use statistics to test our research hypothesis. We only use statistics to test our null hypothesis. Based on the outcomes of our statistics, we're going to make one of two decisions. We are either going to reject the null hypothesis or we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, we don't accept, as Yoda says, there is no accepting of the null hypothesis. So let's go back a slide. If my statistics state that I should accept my null hypothesis, that means I'm saying this is true. There is no difference 
or there's no relationship between depression, depression levels and reminiscence therapies. So all that work I did for that reminiscence therapy intervention really didn't work because there's no difference in depression levels between women who did participate and those who didn't. Okay. If my statistics say that I should reject the null hypothesis, then that means I'm going to say this is not true. And if I say the null hypothesis is not true, that means that the research hypothesis is probably true. So that means I'm going to conclude that there is a difference in depression levels that the, between women who do reminiscence therapy and those who do not. So we either reject the null hypothesis, which means we are saying that the research hypothesis is probably right, or we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means we are going to say that the null hypothesis is probably true. Okay, so this one's pro-intervention. This one's not pro-intervention. Okay, so when we're doing hypothesis testing, we're looking at standard deviations. We're not going to get into a whole lot of the math in this class. You've taken statistics. I'm not reteaching you that, nor am I going to have you do any math. Yay! Um, but basically what we're looking at is something called a p-value for statistical testing and statistical significance. The p-value tells us how likely the results are to be true and not as a result of some fluke or chance thing happening. So here's what you need to know. Our cutoff for our p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05. You are not calculating any of this. If you had data, you could put it into a spreadsheet on Excel or some other statistical software package, and it would calculate your, stati your test statistic, and it would give you the p-value. Okay, this isn't something we're figuring out by hand in this class. You could, but we're not going to do that. So let's say our p-value is 0 0.01. That is less than or equal to 0 0.05. So how we interpret that is that our null hypothesis was not supported by the data. So that means we are going to reject the null hypothesis, which means we're going to conclude that our research hypothesis is probably right, at least 95% or more of sure th of that. Okay, so just a little math refresher. 0 0.05 is the same as 5%. So that's like a 5% error we're okay accepting a 5% error. So that means we're 95% or more sure that these results are correct, okay? If our p-value were to be 0 0.123, that is above 0 0.05. That means that our null hypothesis is supported by the data in our study. Therefore, we will not reject the null hypothesis and we would say that the research hypothesis is probably wrong, okay? All right, so again, we're looking at the test of statistical significance, that p-value. We're looking for p-values in the data charts that in our studies that we're looking at. If the p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, that means that we're 95% or more sure that the results are accurate and not the result of chance or some fluke event, okay? Now, there are mistakes that can be made when we do hypothesis testing, and if you've watched all my other videos, you will know one of them by another name, statistical conclusion validity. So basically what's going on up here, if we had a crystal ball and we could look and see exactly what the truth was, is there really in the real world, in the perfect world, if I did a perfect study, is there really a difference or a relationship between independent and my dependent variable? I don't know that for sure. I have to just trust the data I have. But if I could tell, that's what these columns are telling me. These columns are based upon the statistics that I have run. So if my statistics say that we should fail to reject the null, then I interpret that to mean there is no relationship between the variables, okay? If the statistics say we should reject the null, then that means I'm going to accept the research hypothesis as probably being true, okay? So I'm going to start up here in this little box. A type 2 error 
is when in reality, in my crystal ball, there really is a relationship between these two variables. However, I did not have enough people in my study to capture that uh, change. So my statistics, I got greater than a p-value of greater than 0.05. So I believe that, oh man, all this planning, my intervention, it just didn't work. But really it did. If I would have had enough people in my study to give enough power to my study, then I would have gotten more, uh, I would have known, noticed that there really was a relationship between the two variables. So that's called a type two error. It's a false negative, And it means I did not have enough people in my sample size. Okay. For a type one error, that means that my alpha level, my P value was too loose. Most people statistically usually use 0 0.05 as your cutoff, as I mentioned earlier. But sometimes, depending on the question and the type of data that we have, that might not be good enough. We might not want to take a 95% uh, chance. I mean, we might not want to take a chance on a 5% error. We might want to make it tighter and make it a 1% error, which means that we would set our alpha level at 0 0.01. Anything equal to or less than that, we will consider to be statistically significant. And if it's higher, then we're going to say that our null hypothesis was probably true. Okay, so that's a little bit more complicated. We're not going to get into that as much. Okay, so again, type 2 error is a false negative. We believe that our intervention didn't work when in reality it did. And if we would have had a big enough sample size, we would have had enough power to show the difference in the change in that dependent variable. Um, type 1 error means a false positive. We get all excited our intervention worked, but really it didn't. We just did not have our p-value, our alpha set at a stringent enough level. Okay. And then just a last little slide. Please do not like look at all these numbers and start having twitches. <laughs> Basically, I'm just showing you this box to show you kind of what an example of a statistical table looks like in a results section of a quantitative study. This is the p-value. That P, that A is alpha. So that's telling you what the alpha level is. This study, if you would have actually read in the results section or actually in the data analysis section, they say that their alpha level for this study was a 0 0.05. That's the gold standard, if you will. So you could actually go down this column and look and see, are there any 0 0.05 or less? And there was, there's only one. I circled it for you. 0.041. So that result is statistically significant. That means that the personal control score was statistically different between the experimental group and the control group for this study. Okay. Sometimes reading these tables is a little bit complicated. So you need to make sure you're reading the title, looking at all these little headings, and then reading any of the subscript up underneath the table so you know how to interpret it. Okay, so personal control is statistically significant. The changes between the groups for the rest of these things are not statistically significant. So we cannot say for certain that our intervention really made a change in these other, uh, in these other variables. It could have been by chance that those numbers are different. So we can't say that that was a big change. So hopefully I have not panicked you with all of the statistics and the data in this. When, if you go on to graduate school, you're going to learn a lot more about statistics from a much higher perspective, but this is giving you a good baseline. Basically what I want you to know in, t in hypothesis testing is that we're testing to see if we were probably right or probably wrong using p-values and the correct statistical tests based on the levels of measurement nominal ordinal interval a ratio. All right, we could have gotten a lot more in depth, but this is good enough for today. All right, thanks for watching.